Good morning, everyone. I'm Alan Rothschild. I'm from Casanova, New York. I have a patent model collection. Patent models are the models that the inventors turned into the patent office to obtain a patent. And the Patent Act started in this country um, on April 10th of 1790. George Washington, the president at the time, signed the very, very first Patent Act in the country. And for the very first time, it, it allowed inventors to uh, protect their, their patent and also, um, if it was successful, to, um, to make a profit uh, from their, their, their patent. The requirement started out in 1790 that they had to write a description of what their invention was, what the claims were, and also submit a model of, of the invention. The requirement um, was that it, it should be compact and not larger than 12 inches square in any dimension. However, um, there were some oversized models um, throughout the years. So during the period from 1790 to 1836 is a very, very special time in the history of the, of the patent office for a few different reasons. Number one, the Patents that were issued during this period of time, which was about 9,750, they were not numbered. They just recorded the inventor's name and the, and the date and what the invention was, but they did not number them as we know numbers in the patent system today. The second thing was is that all of the patents um, that were issued and the models that the patent office had got destroyed in a fire on December 15th of 1836. And the third thing that was special about this period of time is the almost 10,000 patents that were issued, the inventors received the uh, patent papers. The, this would be a copy of what the patent paper would look like during this period of time. And each and every one of the patents was signed at the time of the sitting president, the secretary of state, and the attorney general. So this patent was 1797. That was the last year that Washington was uh, the president. And this is signed by George Washington as president, Timothy Pickering as secretary of state, and, and Charles Lee as attorney general. Six other presidents went on to sign um, the patents. Jackson was the last president to sign, to sign any of the patent papers, and that was in 1836. On July 4th of 1836, the, um, they changed the regulations for, for patents. In the beginning, the first 40 years, the fee was $4 to um, su submit a patent, and you had to be a citizen of, um, of the US. In the new system, um, allowed foreigners to submit a patent. The price for a US citizen was $30, a British subject, you won't believe this, it was $500. And for anyone from any of the other countries, it would be 300. So basically, <laughs> so basically, the patent office was saying we really don't want um, patents from, from foreign countries at, at, at this time. So what happened with that part is from 1830, Six to about the time of the Civil War, 1861, there were about 23,000 patents issued. And now they were numbered. The first patent um, that was granted on 
in December of 1836 was patent number one. I have to go back a little bit though. The patents, the th 10,000 patents that got destroyed, the government in 1836, the fire was in December 15, 1836. In 1837, Congress put up a fund of $100,000 to try to get as many models remade uh, as they could to get destroyed and about 2,000 of the models um, got remade. After the fire, one of the examiners evidently had enough information that he had in his home, and they recreated a list of the 9,700 patents, and they numbered them in sequence, starting with number one, but they put an X in front of the number to distinguish them from the new numbering system that began in 1836 with patent number one. This would be a copy of the very, so there's two number one patents actually. This one is X1. So this is the very, very first ever patent in 1790 and it was for a process of making uh, pearl ash um, and potash which was made to, um, to make soap and, all, and also glass. Now we go to eight, July 15th of 1836 and we have patent number one, which is now part of the same numbering system that we have today, which, we have, which I believe there's over eight and a half million patents. So the requirement um, changed in 1836 and that way, um, basically, the, the system has stayed that way since. Of course, the prices have, have changed, and we are still in the uh, same sequence. The, the number of patents um, by 1870, the requirement was lifted because there was about 225,000 patents had, had been issued by this time. Patent office could no longer handle the, the influx of, of the number of patents that, that were coming. And so they said, no more patent models. We've, we're gonna end that requirement. The inventors still turned them into the, to the patent office and in, in 1880, the patent office finally said, we, we really don't want any more models. So the numbers went down of the models submitted, but they still were submitted in smaller quantities until, until about 1900. The Civil War, um, I'm gonna go back a little bit. The Civil War in, started in 1861, and the number of patents fell off for the very, very first time that, that inventors were applying for. And so the patent office made a decision. They said, we're going to um, take away the requirement for the, for the two fees for, for England and other foreign countries, and we're going to charge the same amount for everybody, which was about $40 um, at this period of time, because them doing that, a huge amount of foreign patents then started coming into the patent office. So it took up the slack from the um, inventors in, in this country. So by about 1893, the patent office said, we're going to put the models into storage. They were in, they were in the museum that was in the patent office that had got built in started to get built in 1836, which is now the National Portrait, Portrait Gallery in Washington. That was the replacement for the first patent office that, um, that got destroyed in a fire. And the museum was there. It was a very, very popular museum. It was really one of the main attractions in Washington um, during the, during the um, mid to late 1880s. Um, 1800s. So the Congress um, said we're going to um, pass a, a legislation to get rid of the models. 
And that's exactly what happened. In 1925, after they'd been in storage for about 30 years, there was an auction you know, right here in New York City, and an individual, Sir Henry Welcome, the founder of the Welcome Drug Company, which is now uh, Galax, called maybe Galaxo Welcome, which maybe you're familiar with, he won the bid, and his intention was to build a patent model museum. Unfortunately, the crash of 29 came. He did not accomplish that. He passed away um, soon afterwards, and his estate sold the models in 1935 to a couple of investors from New York City who bought them basically to, to make a profit. They, they were selling the models. They did that for a few few years, they got sold again to a, a, another um, group, and finally they were purchased in 1939 by an individual named O. Rundle Gilbert, who was an auctioneer and a real estate um, individual on, from the garrison um, on the Hudson. And he also made catalogs and was selling the models but he held them for about 40 years, till about 1979, and then he sold the remainder of the collection that he had to an individual that was an aerospace engineer named uh, Cliff Peterson. Peterson also um, made catalogs and was selling the models, and he had, um, he basically kept the models for about 20 years, having some auctions, selling models individually. I just stumbled into the models at an antique show um, in the early um, 1990s, and, and I really thought these are the greatest things I'd ever seen. I, I was always very, very mechanical. I have two of my own patents. I didn't realize that there were patent models, and I thought they were great. So I did a little investigating. I, I bought a few, and then I found a few more and bought them. And it, it, being a, a collector prior to this, um, I just got totally fascinated by it. And I contacted Cliff Peterson, who was getting in his um, elderly years and, and was a little bit frail. And we made a um, deal that I would buy a, a small block of uh, models from him. And then a few years later, he kept asking me why, why I don't buy the rest of his collection. So by the time I got done, I, I have a collection of 4,000 models and it's the largest private collection um, of U.S. patent models in, 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 the, in the world. I, I've had exhibits um, in many, many places. I've had a traveling exhibit for, um, that has just ended five years of traveling throughout the country that has been to 15 museums. And just last year, the two-year exhibit at the um, Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, we had um, about 35 models on display for two years, and that is the building I talked about. That's the portrait gallery in the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which was built for the patent office in, in, 18, um, in 1836. The second fire I didn't mention in 1877 in, in in the patent office building, uh, 80,000 models were destroyed in, a, in a, a major fire in, I believe, the north wing of the, of the patent office. The, the building was supposed to be fireproof, but evidently it wasn't. And the models after that um, fire, the remaining models, were kept in, in fireproof um, area. So, I've brought today um, 
I brought today some models that we can talk a little bit about. The, the pigeon starter, let me ask if anybody knows what a pigeon starter is. Anybody? No. Pardon? Um, close, but not exactly. Well, this model was um, number 159846, 159,846, and it was patented uh, February 16th, 1875. This was done to scare pigeons into flight, and basically what happened is the model got into a crouching position, and it was time you would pull the cord and the pigeon starter would pop up and make a loud noise. It's not doing that now, but it, it used to do it. And the purpose was that the shooting of live pigeons um, for sport, it was actually started in England. It came to this country and actually this area of the country, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, it was a very, very popular sport. The, the pigeons were kept in cages below, in traps, below the grade surface. And it was time they would open up the trap. The pigeons maybe would come out, maybe not. You, the inventor said it was hard to get them to fly. The, the, the target shooters would throw stones and yell at the pigeons to, to try to get them to fly. And the inventor felt that it, it was affecting the, the uh, shooter's concentration. So this is what he came up with. Soon afterwards, the government said, can't shoot live pigeons anymore. Um, it was against the law. So what happened? A clever inventor came up with a, an invention, something new. He came up with a, a clay disc. And what was the clay disc called? A clay pigeon. What was the sport name? Trap shooting. And remember, the pigeons were kept in, in traps. If any of you know, anybody that does uh, trap shooting, ask them if they know why it's called trap shooting, because most trap shooters don't have a, a clue why it's, why it's called that. The mouse trap um, is from 1870. It was invented by uh, two co-inventors. Um, you could have co-inventors. You, you, could, you could not have then or today. A company cannot have a patent. Um, a company can be assigned a patent. So if somebody's working for a company, the, the patent would be in their name, not the company's name, but it would be assigned to the company. So a patent has to be to an individual. The, the mousetrap, um, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the, the great essayist, said in a lecture in 1871, if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. Well, 44 hundred inventors tried to do that. That's how many patents have been issued for mouse traps. And believe it or not, only about 25 of those 4,400 were, were ever profitable. But the most profitable mouse trap ever, and I'm sure everybody has seen this, is this little wood mouse trap that was invented in 1895 by John Mast from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And this is still made today after all those years. It's very, very inexpensive. They sell the company Woodstream and it's labeled a Victor mousetrap. They sell about 10 million of these mousetraps a year. And if you just it's as simple as that. But it closes at 38 thousandths of a second. This mousetrap, this inventor tried to create the better mousetrap. And it's pretty clever. 
The difference between this one and this one is this is a live trap. It's similar to have a heart trap. So what happens here is the mouse comes up here, there'd be cheese on here, and the mouse is gonna eat the cheese and he's going to fall in the trap. The trap will then come. This would be baited ahead of time. Mouse eats the cheese, the trap falls. So this will hold four mice. You can bait this four different times at the same time and then there's a trap door underneath where the mouse can come out. So this is a humane trap and it probably never worked because it's too elaborate. You, the, can you imagine the cost of this in the 1800s versus this? Th this was pennies, this would have been you know, dollars. It's, it's a very elaborate trap. So that's why everybody wants to create a better mouse trap. I'm, I'm writing a, um, a book with, um, with Make, and the name of the book is Inventing a Better Mousetrap. But I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. <laughs> Washing machines, 1869, number 90,416. Washing machines were very, very prevalent. Why? Because every household needed a washing machine. And if some of you have been to antique shows, you'll see tons of old washing machines, great big tubs. And there were hundreds and hundreds of patents for washing machines. But the bulk of them, the washing machines, the water had to be heated at a different source from the washing machine. They'd have to be done a, a, in an open fire, um, maybe on a kitchen stove, and the water would have to be brought to the washing machine. This inventor, and there were only a couple that are known at this period of time, 1869, this inventor was very, very clever. He built a similar washing machine to all the ones that were out there. It's got a cylinder, you put the clothes in the cylinder, along with the soap, you fill it up with water, but what he did is he, he, he lined the tub with, with metal, with tin, and what did he do? He built a firebox underneath it. It could be either wood or a coal fire, put a smokestack on it, put a crank on it, and basically what you have is you have today's washing machine. If you put a window in it and brought some power here, and some energy to heat the water, you would have a modern day washing machine. It was so simple, but hundreds and hundreds of inventors never thought about the fact of heating the water at, at the source. A little ingenuity, once again. This would be a couch on my right, on, on your left, and person using it in the household, they maybe come home every night, whoever, they lie on it. They say, you know, I really would like to reverse it. Well, if they reverse it this way doesn't make sense. The inventor said, well, I got a great idea. I'll just take the same couch, I'll move that over, and I'll put the head now over on that side. Very, very clever. You wouldn't find this in a store today, because the store wants to sell you two couches. <laughs> and the inventor said, well, for convenience and also if you lie the same way all the time, you're gonna wear out the material. We can go back and forth and the material will, will wear evenly. So it was pretty clever. Once again, um, people always ask, you know, were these in inventions, um, did they make it into the real world? Um, I don't think any um, of, of these did, but this one right here, the electromagnetic motor was made, um, and this probably, although it was a model submitted, I know for a fact that um, this probably was a production model and this, this was made. 
This is an uh, electromagnetic motor from 1872, uh, 122,944. And basically this would um, probably be operated um, by a battery. Um, we've got the coils that would be, um, become magnetic, the bars would be drawn down, and basically this would just continuously spin. We've actually had this working um, from, it, it would have been built for direct current, and we uh, converted it to hook up to um, 110 uh, alternating current, um, and it actually works. And, and what you have is, you have the wheel here, this would be hooked up, and this probably was used to, to power at the time a sewing machine, but it could, it could, actually, power, it could actually power anything. Um, my time is almost up, um, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. Yes. Yes, that's a great question. Um, model making was a profession. Um, there were many, many model makers because you had to make a model. Um, most, probably 99% plus of the models were made by uh, professional model makers. At the time, they charged about 50 cents an hour, which was a very, very high wage for, for this period of time. But you can see, you know, from the, from the simple thing that probably could have been made in, you know, an hour or so to the electromagnetic magnetic motor, which would have been quite a chore to make it. Uh, you know, cast iron, brass um, parts. Um, but there were many, many model makers. They, they uh, many of the models were, were actually working. They had to show the claims of what the inventor was trying to invent. And the other thing is that the United States is the only country in the world that in their patent system ever required um, models. No other country ever required any, any models. And the reason they claimed that in this country that they did it they thought it would help the patent examiners to understand what the inventor was trying to patent. And also, if somebody else put a similar patent in, they could actually physically compare the two models to see if there, if there was any infringement on the, on the one that received the patent. Yes? I'm sorry, say it again. No, the, the models were all miniature. Um, there's a lot of models in the collection, like tools and different things that are actual size. There, there were no dimensions required. Um, the patent office didn't care what size this motor was or the washing machine. And it's the same today. There's no requirements for dimensions. The patent office only wants to know if there's infringement um, on what somebody's trying to invent. And the claims are what you need to show, at least when you had models, it had to show the claims. But um, a lot of the models um, actually did work like, just like the electromagnetic motor. I mean, it, it, it worked then and it works today. Any other questions? Thank you all.